The Colts conjecture is commonly presented as the simplest unsolved math problem, and as you can see, there are quite a few videos on it already. I've never found a video that covers my favorite analysis method, which happens to involve hyperpyramids and their frustrums, so I figured I'd make one myself. As mentioned before, there are already a lot of good videos on the Colts conjecture, so we're going to not spend too much time on the basics. The conjecture is related to the repeated application of this function to a starting positive integer seed. It postulates that every starting seed will eventually reduce to 1. In this case, we use the seed 17. If we look at the list of numbers, we can notice that for every odd number in the list, there is always an even number after it, but the reverse is not true. This means that between each odd number, there is a variable amount of steps that are made. From a list of variables, we can form a vector. Now we have a method to model how each starting seed behaves as a vector. Since there's always a guaranteed even number after an odd number, we don't really need to count that one, so we're going to subtract one from each of the elements of the vector. With this, the jump has been made from an arithmetic sequence to linear algebra. The Colas conjecture, if it is true, requires that every odd number has a vector like this. While this is cool, it doesn't provide much insight because it's just a restatement of the original problem. Instead, we should look for hypothetical counterexamples. Before going further, I'm going to spend a little time explaining the terminology that will be used as well as some shorthand notation which will simplify the equations later on. The most important thing is how we're going to be defining vector length. Typically, the length of a vector is calculated by summing the square of each element, which is considered the Euclidean norm. But for our purposes, we're going to be using the sum of the absolute values of each element, so not squaring anything, which is typically called the rectilinear distance or the Manhattan distance. In 3D, we can easily see the difference between the metrics. If we set the sums equal to a constant, the set of 3D vectors with the same Euclidean distance form a sphere, and the set of vectors with the same rectilinear distance form a plane. To reduce clutter in equations later on, there will be a little bit of shorthand notation. The vector in use will always be a capital S. I will be using the hat symbol to indicate the rectilinear distance. In addition, all subvectors will always start at the first element, so there's only a need to indicate the final element, as you see here. The iterative application of the original equation looks like this and after an arbitrary number of steps, it should either reduce to 1, or, in the case of a counterexample, return to itself again. There's another potential case where the outputs increase indefinitely, but this is beyond the scope of what we're doing here. We're looking for counterexamples, so the equals n case is the important one. If we do some algebra and expand out the iteration, it looks like this. We can reduce the series of fractions that don't have n next to them into a summation and have a clean looking equation. Looking at this equality, we see that the summation will always be positive, so the fraction scaling the n value must always be less than 1, if adding a positive will let it equal 1. We can then define a lower bound for the times n can be divided by 2, which would be a bound on the sum of s. To find an upper bound, think about how s hat equals m means an average division by 4 in each step of the loop. The only way to increase the numerator by a factor of 4 with the equation 3n plus 1 is by having n equals 1, so any counterexample must have s hat less than m. With a little more algebra, we can isolate n. We can then replace n with a function in terms of s that we'll call d. D maps m-dimensional vectors of natural numbers to real values. Applying the bounds we found for s hat to D defines a solution space that would contain any closed loop counterexamples to the conjecture. Let's look at the m-2 case. The lower and upper bounds form a trapezoid with the axes, which contains no valid s vectors. However, there are three integer points within the triangle formed by the lower bound in the axes that all happen to be negative n-valued loops in the original equation. The s equals 0, 0 loop goes negative 1 to negative 1. The s equals 0, 1 and s equals 1, 0 points 
represent the negative 5 to negative 7 loop. Let's move to 3D. Our bounds on S are now represented by planes in 3D space. Since the elements of S can't go below 0, the bounds on S fully enclose a volume in 3D, or hypervolume in higher dimensions. The full solution space, including both the negative and positive solutions of our equation, is bound by an m-dimensional pyramid, with its base defined by a max-bound plane, lateral faces where s elements are zero, and the apex at the origin. The negative solutions are bound by a smaller pyramid with the base specified by our minimum bound plane. The positive solutions take the form of a pyramidal frustrum, which is the object you get when you chop the top off of a pyramid. It's very easy to visualize the 2D and 3D cases, though this is not very helpful since any counterexamples would be found in high dimensional space. But we can cheat a little by rotating the new dimensions into 3D, treating the 4D frustrum as 3D while maintaining the rectilinear distance of the individual points from the origin but not the distance between the points themselves. There's already so much going on that increasing even further in dimensions would make this too cluttered to make any use of it. If we take the fact that all valid solutions require integer sums, we only need the plane slicing the pyramid at integer rectilinear distances. In this view, we can see that wrapping the fourth dimension into the 3D causes points to overlap, which are indicated with the black border. The known solutions are marked in yellow, Notice that none of the solutions are new to 4D. They are all repeating versions of the solutions from 2D and 1D. For every composite m value, there will be a redundancy of repeated vectors from smaller dimensions, specifically the dimensions of m divided by each of its prime factors. This means that for any counterexample n, there would be infinite s vector solutions tied to it. Another thing of note is that due to the looping nature of the s vectors, only a wedge of points needs to be accounted for for each m. Proving no counterexamples in these points proves no counterexamples in all of the points in this dimension. With the d equation, the Colts conjecture has been reframed as a bounds reduction problem across all vector dimensions. If it can be proven that there are no integer solutions to the d function at an integer composed vector within the bounds, by further constraining those bounds, the closed loop case of the Colts conjecture would be proven.